Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. I'm uh, Greg Get Rich. I'm the CEO of Creatively. Uh, thank you all for choosing to spend about an hour with us. Uh, we were uh, blown away by the number of RSVPs we have for today's class, uh, NFTs for artists. Uh, we had uh, almost 1,500 people sign up for today's uh, class. Uh, and there are uh, many, many of you uh, I see have joined us. So uh, I just wanted to take a moment to say hello. And then I'm going to have the uh, amazing artists uh, who are with us today uh, introduce uh, themselves uh, uh, as well. Um, so as I said, I'm the CEO of Creatively. Uh, if you're new to Creatively, uh, if you just signed up uh, in the last day or week, uh, we're a community of professional creatives. So our whole reason to exist is to help creatives showcase your work, collaborate, and get paid. And on the get paid portion, we have jobs, full-time, freelance, part-time, internships, all paid opportunities uh, on our app. We have an iPhone app uh, and on our website, creatively.life. Um, and you can apply to any of those gigs and recruiters will also reach out to you about opportunities they have. Uh, and then we're rolling out a new payment feature called Creatively Pay. And Creatively Pay will help you invoice uh, all your clients uh, and get paid same day. Uh, and that's what we're most excited about. We're using technology to speed up uh, your payments. So you won't have to wait uh, five days or 30 days or 45 days to get paid. Um, so that's who we are. We have 250,000 individual creatives uh, in our community already in less than two years, uh, 1,900 companies. Uh, what we're seeing and what you no doubt are seeing too is there's a, a huge interest, a big shift to how creatives get paid. NFTs are at uh, the center of that. Uh, there's a lot of um, I think hype, a lot of interest, a lot of discussion. So uh, we're lucky today. Uh, we have three incredible artists from different backgrounds, different industries, uh, different perspectives to uh, chat with us. Um, I'd say view this as a, the first conversation of many. Uh, each month we're going to do a class on NFTs uh, and more. Um, if you have a question, uh, you know, you by now in this pandemic world of ours know how to ask a question on Zoom. But if you go down uh, to the bottom of your screen, you'll see an area for Q&A. Drop the question in there. Uh, Lizzie Mack uh, is with us. She's the voice of God today, so she'll help us curate some of those questions. Uh, but let's get into it. Uh, we'll start with some introductions so everyone knows uh, who's joining us today. And uh, why don't we start, start with uh, Moyo, if you want to say hello and tell folks about you and where you're, where you're coming, uh, where, you're, uh, where you're at right now. Hi, y'all. My name is Moyo Sarah Briggs. I'm a photographer and model based out here in London. Um, I work primarily within the fashion and music industry, but my photography uh, encompasses mainly self-portraiture and kind of the exploration of the self and uncovering one's unconscious mind. Um, I recently got into NFTs. Well, it's been over a year that I've been in the community and I'm like, Really excited to share all that I've learned over the past year with you all. Sweet. Amazing. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, F. Dot, you want to say hi next? Oh, you're on mute. There uh, we go. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Friedensen. Most people know me as F. Dot. I'm a visual artist, illustrator, muralist, uh, animator, and I'm from Brooklyn. And right now I'm coming to you from Colorado. Um, also been in the NFT space for about a year, uh, learning and making my own pieces for about six months, minting my own pieces for six months. Um, really excited to have everybody together for this. And also something that is um, just different about me from the other artists is that I have, ex I have experience in the fine art world, design world, and also like the collectibles world in physical collectibles uh, and digital. So there's a good distinction there we can talk about later. Thank you, Epcot. And uh, Jeremy, uh, your turn to say hello. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeremy. Um, I am primarily a recording artist, music producer, songwriter. I have been in the music industry since 2013, which is almost 10 years, which feels really insane when you think about it. Um, I started with a band called Marion Hill. Um, you might have heard our song Down and an AirPods commercial. Um, in recent years, I've also been working on a side project called Clear Eyes. That is my personal production work. 
Um, and in the last, I think, similar timeline to both of these guys, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was six months or a year, but my first NFT was part of the launch of Catalog, which is a music NFT platform. Um, and since then, I joined FWB, uh, which is a social token gated Discord group. Um, and I've been minting more and more and exploring what music NFTs can be. So excited to talk about that today. Thank you. And it's so great to have you all with us. Uh, you know, our goal is to demystify uh, NFTs as much as we can uh, and really uh, democratize this so everyone uh, feels comfortable uh, about uh, minting NFTs, uh, collecting NFTs, and can, uh, you know, better navigate the space uh, as it's, you know, very new, I think, for most folks. So uh, let's kick it off with a, a pretty simple question, but I think one uh, that'll help us, uh, you know, understand uh, each of your backgrounds in NFTs. And I'll, I'll start with uh, Moya again. Uh, very interested in, you know, what initially got each of you interested uh, in NFTs. Was there one moment that you remember? Um, my journey into NFTs was honestly very much a roller coaster ride. So I first came into contact with NFTs, I would say probably around late 2019. Uh, one of my favorite illustrators who I followed on Twitter, I had seen that he was on a platform called Super Rare, which was still really small at the time. And he was selling his artwork. And I really wanted to be on Super Rare, but around that time, I still didn't really have that much like faith in myself as an artist, which is really sad to say. But then it wasn't until the beginning of 2020, again, I was on Twitter and I remember seeing that Mike Shinoda had minted his first NFT on a little platform called Zora. And I just remember immediately, I was like, I don't know what an NFT is, but I'm going to make one. If Mike is doing it, I'm gonna do that today. And luckily for me, someone gave me an invite to the platform Zora, because at that time Zora was still invite only. And within a week, uh, luckily for me, the Zora team reached out to me and also assisted me in minting, covering the gas costs for my first NFT. And then within that week, I sold my first NFT. So it was everything was really just like back to back. And around that time, I still didn't really know what an NFT was. I just knew that I had made something. It was going to be preserved on the internet forever. And I got paid in like Ethereum. So that was literally like my first experience with, with the blockchain, but it was really exciting. And it was, it's still like the high that I got from that period of time. I'm still honestly chasing that. How did that high compare to uh, you selling your work in other formats uh, in, in the past? It was honestly unmatched. It's so interesting that you asked that because I was thinking about that today. The feeling of knowing, because it had to do more so with the fact that my work would be living on the blockchain indefinitely. And that was something that was completely new to me because I've always been a traditional artist and minting it and having like the provenance and seeing that and then selling that piece from selling prints. It was... I honestly felt like I was in Ready Player One. It was it was such a trip. And like that feeling, I, I think any NFT artist honestly knows that feeling of like selling your first NFT. Thank you. And then uh, I, Jeremy, coming at it from a different perspective, musician, producer, artist, we'd love to you know, kind of hear how you initially got interested in your, your story. Yeah, so I mean, I think my first interest in the blockchain was before NFTs. And it's really interesting because this is, I, I think a lot of musicians, this thing that I'm going to explain was kind of our first touch point. Um, but traditionally the system for collecting music royalties is like horribly archaic. It's like based on player pianos and rec like all sorts of strange artifacts that we now have like mechanical royalties and all these other weird things that come from weird obscure past things and basically there are tons of different revenue streams and it, you need a big corporation most of the time to help you collect all of them if you want to make money as an artist um and someone explained to me i forget when if it was twitter or if it was just a, somebody explaining the blockchain to me in the early days um, but they were saying how you could encode the ownership of the audio and the different people that wrote on it and all of these credits and things in the file. 
and then they would just get paid from what's in the file and you wouldn't need any of this bureaucratic overhead. So initially that gave me this very like, oh, this is, I wanna fo follow this technology and keep track of what's going on. Um, and then I think maybe a year, a year and a half ago, this artist RAC, who I'd grown up on loving his remixes and things, has started tweeting a lot about, you know, retweeting a Zora thing. And I was like, what's that? And like, um, he had this crazy, interesting drop that I still don't fully understand where he did a token that was locked to a tape and you could either turn the token into a physical tape that you would receive or hold the token and watch it gain value. Anyway, as all these things were happening, I started poking around um, and I heard about this platform called Catalog that hadn't launched yet, but they had like a landing page on their site where if you were an artist who was interested, you could fill out a form and they'd keep you posted. Um, and kind of similar to what Moyo was saying, like within a few days, someone emailed me and was like, hi, we're excited you're interested. We'd love to talk to you more about it. Um, and then I was part of their launch and sold my first NFT. Thank you. And uh, Eric? Uh, why don't you tell us the uh, same question? What initially got you interested and um, you know, maybe uh, the story around your first NFT? Sure. So I think it was about a year and a half ago that I first heard the term NFT and a, uh, a friend of a friend was starting his own platform uh, for NFTs. And it turns out it was Kayvon and Charles from Foundation. And uh, so I got on Foundation. I got an invite there. That's an invite only platform still right now, but I got on there like a year ago and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't really get it, but I kept my eyes on it because they were really generous and they invited me to this exclusive platform. And I was seeing how different people were using it. Um, I was also doing these collectible cards and people would always compare NFTs to trading cards because not everybody's into trading cards. So someone who has a crazy trading card collection might sound wild to somebody who doesn't right? Same thing with NFTs. Uh, why would somebody have an NFT? Well, they're just into that. They're into collecting things digitally. And it started to wrap my head around, there is this sort of market for it. Crypto people, uh, digital art fans, um, just, you know, now it's turning into a new way to distribute all kinds of art and different things. So I was just following it on Twitter. Um, eventually, I, I was really scared to admit my first piece, actually, like Moyo was saying, it's so, it's so permanent uh, once you put it on the blockchain and you can burn an NFT, uh, quote unquote, burn it, like send it to an address where it just goes away. But that's also recorded if you do that. So it is very permanent. Um, so I was, I was scared to do it. I was really stuck in my head about what I wanted to create. I ended up collaborating with a friend of mine, uh, Stefan Madioc, to make our first piece. And the piece was literally called In My Head, In Your Head. And it was about that feeling that we had for the first few months before we did this drop um, of how do we navigate this space? How do, how do we understand these new concepts that we're moving into in Web3? Um, and then from there, it was a really awesome bidding war that happened with that auction and it inspired me to keep going on foundation and then eventually doing a small collection on OpenSea. Um, yeah, that's my story. That's great. And, uh, as we, as you each have told kind of your, uh, initial NFT interest and your stories, you've mentioned different platforms. So, um, you know, just understanding that the folks who are joining us uh, across the country, um, have different levels of experience. If you had to pick uh, a platform for someone to go to, to you know, uh, uh, better understand NFTs, to uh, perhaps buy an NFT, maybe sell an NFT, uh, are there one or two platforms uh, that uh, you would recommend? And if not, that's okay too. Just uh, curious uh, because a few of you have mentioned platforms as we've uh, been chatting. Yeah, Jeremy, go ahead. Um, so just quickly, just as platforms come up, one thing that I'm really conscious of as someone in music is that I really think it's better if the more platforms we have, the better. And I'm very wary of, of saying like, this is the one, because the minute one platform gets too much power, then we, we can get into a very bad non-decentralized situation very quickly. Um, that said, um, I'm, I most know about music stuff. Um, I really like catalog a lot. If you want to understand music, one of one NFTs and just get a sense of what's happening. I think they've built a really beautiful site, uh, that does that. And then, uh, sound is a newer platform that I've been involved in also from the start that is doing really cool things that make 
music NFTs a little more accessible. On sound, it's uh, collections of 0.1 ETH um, price point, and on catalog, it's collections of uh, it's one of ones. So the prices often are are higher. Yeah, I totally agree that the more platforms, the better, because really a group of people are coming together to create this platform. You don't really know who started it unless they're really public online. And even if you do, you know, it's there are people who run companies that are more focused on growing their company than they are on actually changing the world. So it's good to try different platforms. It's good to look into different platforms. Like I said, I started on foundation. I was lucky to get an invite, but then I moved to OpenSea. Um, there's different competitors coming out now um, to challenge OpenSea because it is, I think, the biggest, most trafficked one recent as of late. Uh, OpenSea does take a fee and there's other platforms. It's kind of like what's happening right now is a race to the bottom of like how low can the fees go that go to the platform? Because in reality, we don't need middlemen anymore. This is decentralized and that's the spirit of things. I think it's also good to talk about blockchains here. Um, so the main blockchain that I have experience on is Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is not owned by any anybody. Uh, it's owned by everybody, basically. Uh, other blockchains like Solana, Tezos, um, Wax, like Flow, all these other blockchains, they're owned by a company. So there's more risk there, it feels like, to, to try them. At the same time, some of them are more uh, eco-friendly and they've solved a lot of the issues that Ethereum currently has, like congestion. Ethereum also has like the expensive gas fees that go up and down depending on traffic. So if you don't have hundreds of dollars to bet on yourself that you're going to sell an NFT, better not try Ethereum first. Try one of the other platforms, Solana or Tezos. And two platforms that I can recommend for those blockchains. Um, the first one with Ethereum was OpenSea. And then one of their competitors is Looks Rare. Um, the other, yeah, then Foundation. With uh, Solana, there's um, Exchange Art. Soul C, and then with Tezos, there is the object, object.com, uh, O-B-J-K-T, and Hicketnunc, H-I-C-E-T-N-U-N-C. -E so there's a lot of platforms, research them, you know, talk about them, don't decide right away, and I'm gonna be experimenting and minting on multiple platforms. And spend time on those platforms too. So much of the learning I've done about NFTs has been like going to Zora, going to Foundation, going wherever, and just clicking around, scrolling, seeing what I like. There are different curative, like curated vibes on different platforms and it different fits will be for different artists. There's a quick question. Uh, I was sorry if I was talking a little too fast. I know this is a really overwhelming topic and you can't expect to digest all this information. Luckily this is being recorded. So hopefully you can watch back later um, and we can probably follow up with links. But the, the blockchain that is not owned by any one company is Ethereum. Uh, there's a bunch of developers around the world essentially mining the Ethereum and making sure that it goes smoothly, but it can only do a, a small number of transactions per second. So once it gets congested with like a large drop happening, the gas fee shoots up into the hundreds of dollars and it's just like not unusable for something that's not an expensive, you know, fine art piece that you're going to sell for thousands of dollars. If you're trying to start small, one of these other blockchains works really well. I've also found that in the middle of the night, the gas fee is lower. <laughs> And uh, uh, F-Dot, maybe uh, even explain what a gas fee is, because uh, I think some folks uh, uh, listening are uh, confused by that term. So I am not probably the best person to ask about this, but I can explain it in, as, I, as I understand it. Um, so it might not be a perfect answer. But basically, in order to verify your transaction, just like when you go to the grocery store and you swipe your credit card, there's a bunch of things happening behind the scenes that you don't see you know, to verify your transaction and make sure it goes securely. Uh, on, the, on the blockchain, it's the same thing. There's a lot of redundant work that has to happen. Um, the developers and miners around the world essentially are like taking that gas fee in exchange for uh, doing the transaction and running that through the blockchain. And depending on how congested the network is, the gas fee goes up. Does that, was that a pretty good explanation, you guys? Yeah, exactly. And, then, and when you were saying you found the gas fees are lower overnight, it, that's uh, obviously appealing because you're the one paying the gas fee, right? Well, There's it depends. Yeah. <laughs> some platforms, the collector pays it. Some platforms, you kind of play chicken with the collector and see who's going to pay it. Um, I was just also going to say quickly while we're on gas fees that I found there is a Twitter account, which is at low alert that only tweets uh, when gas fees are lower and I have alerts set and I don't always 
catch it, but it's a nice way to keep tabs on gas fees if you are thinking about buying something and want to do it at a more affordable time. Oh, that's a good tip, Jeremy. And uh, before we move on, I just want to go uh, uh, to Moya because I don't think uh, yeah. you got a chance to talk about her favorite <laughs> yeah, platform. So. No, it's all good. I mean, for me, when it comes to platforms, I do focus more so kind of like what Evdot said on the specific chain, but also on the community and the curation. So my favorite platform on the ETH chain is definitely Zora. They've got a very strong community. They also help the artists that mint on their platform. And aside from that, there are multiple other platforms which have been built and created through forking the Zora protocol. And Zora also assists you if you so decided as an NFT artist to create your own marketplace, you can get assistance from the Zora team and use their own code to make your own marketplace and your own auction house. Um, but like I said, it has to do more so with curation because for example, on the Matic chain, you have NFT Treats, which is an NFT platform that focuses more on NSFW artwork and artwork for sex workers. So on different chains, you have different communities and you have different platforms that cater to different artists. But for me, I'm completely biased and like Zora is my all time favorite. Like I'm obsessed with them. I also should say catalog, which I've been talking about is built on Zora. Actually, Catalog as well. I recently just got onboarded onto Catalog last week too. So I'm about to join Jeremy in the music game very soon. Amazing. Well, and thank you all for sharing your favorites. And I think to go back to what you know, each, each said is it's uh, you know, our community should explore all these. Um, and it's, you know, there's new uh, options all the time, uh, but I think it helps to get your guidance. Um, so one of the biggest uh questions I and mean, challenges our community uh talks to us about is as an artist as a creative in order to have opportunities in order to find work in order to get paid you need to build uh awareness uh around who you are uh around your artwork uh, and your skills and disciplines and that obviously holds true with no matter what you're doing but very curious when you think about that uh and how it connects to nfts um, do you have any advice uh, for uh, our community on how to stand out, you know, tactics to leverage, uh, things to do or things to avoid? I can uh, start it off. Um, one thing to avoid is to immediately just try to sell right away. Uh, it sounds counterintuitive, but the community really comes first with this stuff. Uh, if you have some collectors that like your art already, or they, maybe they bought physical pieces or supported your music or whatever, you can sort of sort of bring them into the world with you by offering them NFTs on a platform that accepts fiat, perhaps. Um, I've done that before, and it was an easy way to bring some collectors in with me and then build from there. Um, but really, it's about like lifting up other people in your sphere. And then eventually, you'll feel like you have, you can kind of support each other and reshare each other's work and, and eventually you'll have your time in the, in the spotlight, but when you're not selling, it's good to really focus on helping others. It's a, really a new mentality in, in social media, which didn't exist quite as much on places like Instagram, where there's not as much com real conversation happening. Twitter is like all about this community conversation and lift, lifting each other up. Like literally piggybacking off of what FDOT said, I was literally gonna say it, it has to do mainly with community you can't just go into the space expecting that you're going to mint an NFT and like immediately sell it. Like as soon as it's minted on a platform, I feel like this, it, this kind of connects more to the traditional space, the way if there were no NFTs as an artist, you would still go to exhibitions. You would connect with artists. You would speak to them. You would learn from them. That's definitely something I recommend any artist who's coming into the NFT space to do first find like-minded people, connect with people, enter Discord spaces, find out about DAOs, which we'll talk about later. And once you find your, your the people you connect with and you, you have to be consistent as well, once you, you're consistent with your work and your creations, the collectors will find you and more people who are like you will gravitate towards you. Yeah. 
I really seconding what they both said. I think Twitter has become Twitter and Discord are really the the homes for this community building that we're talking about and a lot of this NFT stuff. But there's really a like there's such a culture of artists sharing other artists' work that I've found really inspiring. And it's really as simple as like if you if you get on your Twitter and you start trying to find like even if you follow the three of us to start <laughs> find some other people who are doing NFT stuff that excites you. A lot of times people just post tweets like share your art and they might not see your reply with your art, but someone else might. And like so much of the artists I've discovered have been because I followed one artist who then reposted their work and then I followed them and then someone reposted their work, it's like some other new work. And you can get into these really cool feedback loops of that. Um, so I would, it's really, it, it can feel intimidating to build a community, but it's really as simple as just like showing up on Twitter and asking questions and posting work you're excited about. Thank you. Um, all right, another big question that we're getting in the Q and A and that we've uh, heard before goes back to um, you know when you look at what's happening now, and I'd say kind of over the last six months uh, or or a year, and you see the NFTs that are getting the most attention, the NFTs that are uh, getting the most hype, the biggest headlines, driving the highest prices. Um, do you think that it is indicative of what will happen going forward? Um, and then I guess a quick follow-up, um, is there a difference between um, uh, collecting NFT art and uh, making uh, tactical investments uh, uh, around NFTs? I think that the, like, the question that you asked that kind of is what makes the NFT space special and different from the traditional art space. You have individuals who come into NFTs simply to make investments, but then you have artists such as FDOT and Jeremy and myself who are coming into the space to bring one of one artworks or very important pieces that we've created to sell. And, um, Oh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, ADHD brain. But um, I feel like people shouldn't be discouraged by it. Uh, no, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. No, so that's okay. I, still, I think uh, I'm going to jump in too, so. Sure, so I think that with cryptocurrency, it started out as partially an investment vehicle for a lot of people. So you get a lot of those people who are don't know much about art. They're just getting introduced to art and that drives some of the taste you know a lot of these people came from uh software engineers web developers backgrounds so they like memes they like pixel art they like these different trends and they were there they were there first to make nfts these, these types of people so the older the nft sometimes that adds value to it and that's why we see these these pieces um making sometimes millions of dollars I think there is definitely a difference between collecting art and buying it just to flip it. I do both, honestly. Um, I collect other artists, I mint my own work. I also buy work because I think the value is gonna go up and it's a way for me to kind of keep supporting other artists and keep supporting what I'm doing as well without putting all the pressure on myself. And I like the values of some of these communities. Um, when you dig deeper, it's, it's some of them aren't just cartoon profile pictures, but they have a mission and they have uh, in-person events and some of those are really trying to change the world and they're using this as a vehicle so if one of your goals is to change the world in some way try to find a project that resonates with you and see if if you can support them in their mission and then they'll probably end up supporting you back at some point um yeah. but I, I do agree that like the taste level I, in the long term i think the art will the art that's in the headlines will get better and better as people kind of like i, I just think art will good art will prevail there will always be more trends coming um, and will confuse the public and make everybody scratch their heads and like, how is that possible, right? Um, but we're definitely in a new world where we don't really make the rules. Uh, the, the art museums aren't the ones curating these shows anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. I think also it's like when it comes to collector versus investor, it's really a spectrum and I think it's always been 
like fine art has always been a sort of investment. Um, and I think it's really every, every collector has a different compass that they're going by. There are some people that really are just trying to make a buck. And there are some people who are really only there for the art and people everywhere in between. I know for me, I personally have a rule where like, if I'm going to buy an NFT, I want to like it enough that I would be happy if I didn't, if I wasn't able to ever make any money off of it. But if an opportunity comes along where I can, like, it's also really cool to be able to take advantage of that, to be like, wow, I love this piece of art. I bought it. And it also made me money. And both of those things supported the artist who made it. And that's a really cool feeling. Um, and I, yeah, to, to echo what everybody else is saying on the the community aspect is really the most exciting thing about these 10,000 piece collections. It can be overwhelming to be like, why do these cartoons matter so much? Um, but it's really about like, how do we build this cool group of people who are excited about the same things and what can we do together? Um, but like everybody said, I think it will ebb and flow with time. And there have always been weird trends that make a lot of money and then people move on to the next weird thing. And it'll be really interesting to see the stuff that lasts and I am hoping it'll be the best. I just, uh, want, to, I think, I just want to add one more thing on that. I think we're seeing history repeat itself in some ways. Like whenever there was a big technological revolution, like when the printing press came out or when the computer came out, all these capitalistic type people come in thinking they can make money. They don't really care about the quality of the art or the long-term effect of that art or that much. So you're seeing a lot of these people come in and use the technology solely to make profit or to scam people. And that's something we should talk about a little bit later to how to avoid some scams. Cause just like any technology, you can end up in trouble uh, if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, I just wanted to add that. Also, I'm just, adding, oh, go ahead. Sorry, just adding from what Jeremy said as well, it's finally come back to me. A lot of these <laughs> collectible projects, they do, so well because of the community like these are a lot of the tech bros and the chads in DeFi have spent like most of their youth just like working and working and now with nfts they can come together with their senses of humor and be in discord chats talking for hours and hours about these paper memes and like just from that sense of community they can drive the price of a picture of a frog on a broom. And as much as it's very much like, is the art good? The art isn't really good. The, the power that that has, I feel like you can't necessarily knock it. You almost have to kind of give it a nod to be like, wow, you all came together as a community to give this project life, even though the art is terrible. So yeah. No, I, I, as you all have been talking, I've been keeping an eye on the questions coming in uh, from our audience and our community. And as you'd imagine, there's uh, fast and furious questions about when does the artist get paid? How does the artist get paid? Can the artist get paid multiple times? What's a smart contract? So uh, maybe if we walk through that uh, in your own experiences around, um, you know, first, uh, when do you get paid? How does that happen? And then uh, how do smart contracts come into that relationship and either benefit artists or not? Yeah, um, go for it, Moya. Different platforms have different methods of payment. And a lot of the times it still has to do with gas transactions. So for example, platforms like Zora and Foundation, Known Origin, uh, Maker's Place, when you mint an NFT and you set the price or you set the auction price, either fixed or auction, once it's gone to the highest bidder or if it's been bought, you will have to put through a gas transaction so that you can take the funds out of escrow, which will then be sent to your wallet. But a platform like OpenSea, um, because of the way the, the contracts are set on OpenSea, you can sell an NFT and the funds will immediately be sent to your wallet. But not every platform on the ETH blockchain does that. Yeah, yeah some platforms have things set up where they 
if they settle it for you or the person buying it settles it and that's built into the payment thing. Um, I just wanted to quickly add in smart contracts. Platforms are different about this, but one of my favorite features of it is when you can build in a royalty for artists. Um, you can build in uh, such that when I make an NFT on catalog, for instance, I can set a 15% royalty for myself. And what that means is that it doesn't apply to the first sale. The first sale, I get all everything. But after that, if the person who bought it decides to sell it again, um, whatever it sells for automatically when they settle that transaction, because it's in the contract, my wallet will also be paid out the percentage. So you continue to benefit. And Jeremy, in your experience with that, were you able to change the royalty and set it? Uh, or is it standard in the, in the contract? It varies. Um, catalog, you can set it. I think that's a thing in Zora. Like Zora's protocol allows you to set it. I think some other sites have it built in at a certain rate, like 10% or something, but I am not an expert on the nuances of that. And after that, I see you uh, can jump in, so I'll hand it off to you to get uh, any comments on yeah. payment and smart contracts. I think just going back to basics, uh, you have to have a wallet to store your funds in and to accept the funds when you sell something. That's a digital wallet, crypto wallet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, one of the main ones that everyone uses, at least for the Ethereum, is called MetaMask. And when you set one up, whether it's through MetaMask or through uh, Trezor or um, Phantom Wallet, which allows you to use Solana and other chains, uh, if they give you a passphrase, a secret passphrase that you should never type into any device, you should write it down somewhere really safe, lock it up. But if you lose that phrase, you'll... It's, and you and you also forget your password. You won't be able to get anything out. And if conversely, if you give that phrase to anybody uh, or show it to them, they can get anything that's in your wallet. So security is really important. Don't click links unless you're sure. Don't connect your wallet to websites unless you're sure it's the right website. Um, that's the way we log into these marketplaces: is we connect our wallets. It's not no longer a username and password. It's like a connect wallet button that people will hopefully slowly get used to, and it'll become kind of normal to access content, to buy things, to sell things. Um, and then in terms of smart contracts, um, do we move on to that or? Sure, I think that'd be helpful. We're, uh, yeah, why don't you keep uh, talking about smart contracts? Sure. And then if, if uh, uh, there's also questions about acceptable royalty ranges. Um, and if you have a point of view on that, that'd be helpful too. Yeah, so smart contracts are essentially a, a bunch of code that enables all this to work. And you can do a lot of really creative things with that. Um, so many different examples of that you can research to find out more on that. But it's important for artists to realize that when they do mint an NFT, it's going onto a smart contract. If they didn't set up that smart contract, it's someone else's contract. OpenSea, when you go there, for example, to make an NFT, it's their contract. And let's say they go down in the future, 10 years, 20 years down the line, you might not be able to get your NFT back depending on what that looks like. So it's important to research how to make your own smart contract and new tools are coming out every week. It feel, it seems two resources that I can recommend for at least for um, Ethereum and Polygon, which is like a layer on top of Ethereum. So there's no gas fees on, on Polygon um, is manifold.xyz is where I set up my smart contracts. I set up two of them, one for one of ones and one for additions, two, two different standards of contracts. And then the other one is called Nifty Kit. Nifty Kit is a little more expensive to set up, but you can do a larger operation, also set up your own marketplace there. Do um, you guys have any other places where they let you do, oh, also foundation, you can do your own smart contracts. It's probably gonna be a lot more commonplace to see artists make your own contract. And then once it's, minted through that contract. You can do that through the back end of Manifold or Nifty Kit. Then you can sell it anywhere because it's on the it's on the network. So OpenSea essentially is like a directory. These, these platforms are directories for anything that's on the chain. Once it's minted, you can sell it on any of the platforms. Just kind of piggybacking off of what FDOT said and hopefully I don't lose my train of thought this time, but <laughs> Uh, like a more technical description, because I only just recently started reading up on smart contracts as well myself. 
basically to explain it kind of like for the layman in technical terms, a smart contract is a type of Ethereum account, which means that it is um, an entity that basically has an Ether balance and can send transactions um, on Ethereum. And it's not controlled by a user. How smart contracts work is that you will deploy your contract and set the programming and then it, it's set in its ways and that's how it will be programmed. And um, it allows artists to have kind of like true creative ownership of their work. If you deploy your own smart contract, cut exactly like what FDOT said, you don't want to be in a situation where, for example, a platform like OpenSea or Foundation or, or Baby Zora one day disappears from the internet. You want to have your own smart contract, which keeps you in complete ownership of your work. Thank you. Um, so uh, just looking at the questions coming in, a lot of questions uh, about uh, limited editions, batches of NFTs, drops of NFTs. I'm curious whether any of you uh, have released um, limited edition batches in a single drop, and if you had advice for how you went, how you thought about that before you did it, uh, and uh, whether you used generative art uh, or created those um, batches in a different way. Yeah, I can share for sure. Um, so I started with one of ones, and then more recently I've done some additions. And I, I'd like to think about it like any artist from history, Picasso, Andy Warhol, there was a reason that they chose things to be one of ones. And then there, there was a reason that they chose things to be additions. They were slowly writing their own story as an artist and they wanted it to evolve and grow and make sense. So that's what we have to do. We have to ask ourselves those hard questions of, do we want to be really um, scarce with the work that we put out? Or do we want to make it more democratic uh, and able for more people to buy it? Because it's uh, essentially like limited edition prints. Um, what's beautiful about it is that it is authenticated. And just like you, you could technically fake a limited edition print. Uh, if, if you could print one out and just so sign the artist's name and forge it, you can't do that here. It's always traced back to the creator. Um, which sometimes will be verified on the platform. And so what, the way I did my edition drop was I did no, no more editions higher than 20. I think when you go too high, it's a game of supply and demand. We have to think about that as artists always. If you put out too much work all at once, it's probably going to be sitting on the shelf for, for longer. If you slowly put things out um, intentionally and wait till some of them start selling before you make more and more and more, then you're letting the demand build as you market the work instead of just increasing the supply before the demand builds. Um, yeah, I have, I have also mostly done one of ones. I did my first collection as uh, one of the first artists on the Sound XYZ platform that I was talking about uh, earlier. I think I can honestly get very confused when I start thinking about, all oh, right, I want to make more than one, how many should I do? Um, and you're like 10, 30, 2000. There are so many different numbers of collections happening in NFTs right now. I think um, for me and music, doing it first with sound felt safe because they had kind of set a precedent of doing these special drops and there were 25 and it was limited enough that I felt uh, comfortable selling. I think one of the most Exciting things about that is that when is it, when you think about music, when I'm doing one of ones, it is not for my fans, just to be <laughs> blunt about it. It's really not. It's for a different class of collector. It's for maybe a super fan of some, but I don't expect my fans to be bidding one, two ETH for a one of one piece of music from me. Um, sound is hoping door a bit and you get a 0.1 ETH price point, which isn't super cheap but is a lot more accessible and there's also a fun fact of community which i think is the most exciting thing as we've said before about these bigger numbers like we now whereas before i had sold like three nfts but i had three collectors now we have 25 unique ones 
who are all were like, wow, you are excited about my band, Marion Hill. And like, now we know who you are and we're starting a telegram chat and there can be really exciting things, options to build alpha from collections. Similar to Jeremy, I've only created one of one pieces, mainly because of my art style and working with photography and short films. But in the future, I do plan to explore the concept of editions because for me, my one of ones are priced around one ETH or 0 0.8 and in that bracket. But the with editions, it will allow that accessibility for individuals who want to buy my work but don't have one ETH laying around in their wallet. And like with editions, you can price them anything at any price really but usually they will be anywhere from like jeremy said from 0 0.1 to something as low as 0 0.01 and it's that accessibility factor where you can build your community through additions and gain even more collectors both big and small i think one caveat there i've seen some artists go too large on the additions and therefore it doesn't feel and then they'll price it at i don't know somewhere between 0 0.5 and 0.1 ETH. And if there's too many of them, then likely the value might go down once people start selling them. So keeping them small, slow and steady, do an addition of three, addition of five, that still helps you to grow your community faster than doing one of ones if that's a goal of yours. Right, the questions are coming in at a rapid pace. And I uh, just would say to everyone uh, who's been joining us for almost an hour, uh, Lizzie Mack, uh, who is uh, uh, the lead behind all of our classes and uh, community and creator marketing, in the chat, she's been doing her best to drop in the links and uh, updates for what uh, our panelists have been mentioning. Um, if you email creatively at feedback at creatively.life uh, with any follow-up questions, we'll be happy to uh, respond uh, really quickly. Uh, this class will be made available to uh, on our YouTube uh, uh, page for Creatively, so you can watch it back uh, and we'll let you know when it posts. And then uh, a lot of the questions that we're getting are, are questions about like step-by-step -step how to. So what we'll do is we'll uh, have a class, uh, you know, next Creatively classes uh, that we walk you through that step-by-step -step, uh, and we get into the jargon and some of the terminology uh, more. But I think uh, you know, F. Dodd and uh, Moya and Jeremy have done a, a great job too of uh, telling you the places that they've gone to and how they've learned. Uh, so I take them up on that. Uh, but we'll we'll definitely offer you a class on that too because I, I see there's a lot of questions uh, uh, about that. So uh, maybe we'll we'll have two more questions before we run out of time. Um, the first uh, F. Dot mentioned to beware of scams. So wanted to see if any of you have uh, encountered a scam or a type of scam that you think our community should be aware of. You have I mean, Discord scams? Ooh, sorry, Jeremy. I was but gonna that, say the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> the Discord scams honestly are so scary because you can't really tell the difference between a real message from someone you may actually be speaking to and an individual who's sending you a random link. Everyone from notable collectors to emerging artists in the NFT space have experienced at one point clicking a link which has cleaned out their MetaMask wallet. But I kind of like, when it comes to the links, it's the same advice you would give someone in regards to web two. You know, when you get those emails where it's like a prince from like a random country, don't click the link, like just don't click the link. But it's also, you have to be very hyper aware and hyper vigilant because it's in, with the crypto wallets, it's a new thing for a lot of people. And so they don't really know how to navigate the space or how to stay safe, which is why a lot of people would recommend that you should get a hard wallet, which is like what F. Dot mentioned earlier, a treasure, treasure wallet or a ledger wallet, literally what Jeremy has, you yeah, know, get one now um and that will completely keep not completely but it's like 99.9 percent .9 chance of keeping your your crypto safe yeah to, to add to that i think when you when you get a wallet of whatever kind really 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 pay attention to what 
specific transaction you are agreeing to. Um, I think it can become, the wallets are very fun and they let you sign into websites without creating passwords or any of that. And it's really great, but it has certainly led to me being kind of trigger happy. And it's easy to be like, oh, my wallet's popping up. Yep, I agree. Let's see what's going on. Um, and even, yeah, I have been learning and catching myself <laughs> still and just really be aware of the transactions you're making. And if you have a hardware wallet, one thing I've done that gives me some safety um, is I have 90% of my ETH on that wallet. And then I have a hot wallet, which is the wallet I was using before I had my hardware. And I have like a smaller amount of ETH in there that if I spent it all, I'd be okay. And that kind of is a way to keep me from accidentally clicking a thing. And then all of a sudden I've sent way more money than I want because once you've sent it, it is gone. <laughs> and F. Dotter, do you want to add before I move to our last question or? Yeah, I think um, for, if you're collecting or investing in this stuff, it's good to have that uh, wallet that is, I call it like a hot wallet and a cold wallet. You can send your valuable items to your cold wallet that doesn't actually do transactions. You don't log into websites from that wallet. Um, and just to be clear about the hardware wallet, you still have to have a digital wallet to go with the hardware wallet. It's not like the hardware wallet includes everything. It's like you set it up on MetaMask or Trezor or uh, Phantom. And then the hardware wallet just accesses that digital wallet essentially. And it authenticates that it's you because you have it in your hand. You have to press a button in your hand. No one can just, no one can really mess with you remotely, but it's good if you're doing more uh, valuable transactions to have a hot wallet and a cold wallet. The hot wallet is the one that you use more often and the cold wallet is just for storage. Great. Um, well, uh, well, we'll close with one last question. I just wanted to remind our community that we do these classes every month first week of a month we announced the classes so we will without question do a class next month uh on nfts we had an amazing class last month that was called understanding nfts uh where mike kriak walked through terminology uh different sites um uh as well and you can you can watch that on uh youtube lizzie dropped uh, the link uh, in the chat uh if you if you missed that you can always email us at feedback at creatively.life uh, we're here to help uh you know we want to help you all uh showcase your work get discovered uh and get paid so don't be shy about reaching out uh we love hearing from you and helping you where we can so last question we're gonna go a little bit over um is when you look at just the next call it six months because things are moving so fast is there uh, a particular uh, type of art uh, a discipline that you think um, uh, will either get bigger in NFTs is already big, or that has not been represented well uh, and is going to uh, become you know much more prevalent and popular. I mean, we've kind of gone through the seasons. We've had the profile picture collectibles, which kind of dominated a majority of the NFT season, but recently. I think photography NFTs have been on the rise and I think everyone can kind of see that as well. But alongside that, you also have music NFTs doing extremely well. So I think over the next few months, we're definitely gonna see more collectors collecting both photography NFTs and music NFTs. In regards to music NFTs, what we've seen are artists kind of taking back like their independence. So you're gonna have a lot more musicians who are making NFTs. And also the fact that there is so much more utility that can be applied to the NFTs that we're creating as photographers and as musicians and even as illustrators. So definitely over the next six months, we're going to see, I think photography and music in particular, getting more attention. Yeah, just to jump off the music thing, I think I was somewhat early to the music of it all, but they're like, there's about to be in the next few months, even so many music projects launching. Royal hasn't launched yet. 
um, and is a big music NFT platform that'll be coming soon. Sound just launched that I was talking about and is going to be expanding more and more. And just also anecdotally, like in the last month or so, I've had so many um, people reach out to me who are musicians that I've known for a while who are like, all right, talk to me about this. What's going on? And I really think we're kind of nearing a threshold moment um, when that will start to happen for music. And we've really only hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of what music NFTs can be. I think so many people are still exploring that utility. Um, I'm working on a bunch of different ways of it myself right now, including a, a DAO, which we didn't quite get to talk about. Um, but I think there will be really exciting new uh, formulas for what a music company can look like and what it means to uh, have a company that supports a musician. And DAOs basically enable the people to own shares in the company music product that everybody's making together. Um, and uh, yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see uh, we're starting this artist Rio Craig and I are starting a DAO called Loners that will be putting out music and helping bring new uh, musicians into NFTs. Uh, I'd like to say that as a visual artist, it was really overwhelming for me to decide on what to make and what to put out there. Uh, it felt like it had to be digital. It had to be digital art. I'm a physical artist too. I make paintings and prints and I love that aspect of it. I'm romantic about the material of it all and touching it and feeling it and smelling it. So I'd say if you want to make a certain kind of art and that's what you wake up in the morning wanting to make, try finding a way to do NFTs with that instead of trying to shoehorn your existing art practice into some digital three-dimensional animated version of it if that's not your jam. Um, my first piece was animated. I felt like I wanted to take advantage of the digital, like you can't make an animation without digital tools, right? So uh, I, I suppose you could do a stop motion, but you still have to compile it digitally. So I, um, I, I moved away from only doing animations in the beginning and now I'm doing stills and animations. Um, and I'm trying to just make the work that is really authentic to me because I, I want to create for a long, long time. So I have to sustain my passion and not just do things that I think are going to sell to a collector and appeal to a specific audience. That said, I definitely have different styles and my addition pieces might look a little different than my one of one pieces, but uh, it's good to think about really what, what kind of art you want to make and try to find an audience for that instead of pretending to be something you're not. Thank you. I think that's an amazing way for us to wrap. Um, so I would say to uh, the hundreds and hundreds of folks who joined us, um, stay in touch. So there's many ways you can stay in touch. When we wrap, uh, Lizzie's going to put up a screen uh, and you'll be able to see uh, the Twitter handles of everyone who's joined us in the panel today. So you can connect with them, follow them. Of course, uh, they're all on creatively. So, uh, you know, when you're on creatively, connect uh, with uh, not only the artists who joined us today, but other folks who you admire, who you've collaborated with, uh, who you'd like um, to know. A uh, big part of our community is we believe that uh, collaboration and supporting each other is key. Uh, and that's why we do these classes. Email us, feedback at creatively.life uh, again, and we will be quick to answer. We'll let you all know when the uh, video goes live on YouTube. Uh, and then now that you're members of Creatively and you have our iPhone app, uh, you'll get our emails. We do these classes uh, once a month. Uh, we'll always have NFT classes going forward. Um, so, uh, you know, RSVP, uh, let us know which classes you want us to uh, organize. We'll make it happen. Uh, but just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. It's amazing. We had hundreds of participants, almost no drop off throughout. Questions keep coming in. So just apologies that we weren't able to get to all the questions. Uh, but wanted to thank again all of our uh, panelists and artists for joining. It's super helpful and also very interesting. Um, so, uh, thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye, all. Thank you. Great, great hangs.